Hello and welcome to this special edition of Showcase. Today, we delve deep into the lasting genius of a 17th century artist who defied all conventions of the time, acknowledging human imperfection and mortality. Ranging from colossal paintings to miniature prints, his body of work remains one of the most influential of all time. On the 350th anniversary of his death, welcome to a special look on Rembrandt. For the whole of 2019, the Netherlands is celebrating the year of Rembrandt, 350 years after his death. To kickstart this, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam brought together more than 300 of this prolific artist's best works. A perfect chance to get into the mindset of this legendary artist and see his extraordinary talent on display. All the Rembrandts in one place. The Night Watch. The Jewish Bride. Dozens of self-portraits. When it comes to depicting light and shadow, few can compete with the master of the Dutch Golden Age. As part of the Year of Rembrandt celebrations, Amsterdam's Rijksmuseum is hosting the most comprehensive exhibition of the Dutch painter's work by displaying more than 300 of his paintings, drawings and etchings. Visitors get the chance to see the more intimate side of Rembrandt's life and follow the steps of his artistic journey. Well, I think the exhibition wonderfully explains who Rembrandt was as a person. So we really are, well, brought into his private world. And on the other hand, it gives a wonderful overview of Rembrandt as one of the most experimental and innovative artists in Western art history. Rembrandt's work may have inspired many, but his own life wasn't at all glamorous. He lost his wife and son early in his life, went bankrupt, and was buried in an unmarked grave when he died. But these hardships and tribulations gave his paintings the touch of reality. Well, the wonderful thing is, I mean, looking at a portrait like this, for example, how Rembrandt is the artist of human beings. And he never idealizes, so he really portrays people how they are in their strengths and weaknesses. But it was his extreme attention to detail that made him a visionary in the 17th century. Unlike his contemporaries who constantly glorified religion and mythology in their paintings, Rembrandt acknowledged human imperfection and mortality and made these the prime subjects of his art. The light he used when depicting ordinary people feels as if it radiates from the essence of his human subjects, which give his paintings an ethereal and almost spiritual air. Well, I often say he's the first Instagrammer, and that's not trying to be popular, but Rembrandt was, was decisive for the way that we look today, because he was the first artist who depicted the world around him. Otherwise, we would still be um, making images of gods and goddesses. But Rembrandt is the first who paints us as human beings, as we are. For those who want to see Rembrandt's progression from precocious young artist to the master of the Golden Age, the exhibition is on display until June. Now, to tell us more about Rembrandt's supreme painting skills, Rembrandt's life story and the very legacy he left behind, Gary Schwartz joins me. He is an art historian from the United States who has been living in the Netherlands for more than 50 years. Schwartz specializes in the Dutch Golden Age and especially Rembrandt. Hello and welcome to Showcase. Thank you so much for taking the time. So as you're one of the most important experts on this subject and you actually uh, published this book in 2000. 
seven, right? Six. Six, 2006. It's called Rembrandt's Universe from Thames and Hudson. Um, I want to start off by asking, um, 350 years after his death, why are we still talking about Rembrandt? I mean, why, how is he still remembered? Mm. Well, Evo, it's great to talk to you here. I want to thank Showcase for inviting me uh, to talk to your audience about Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt was famous in his time. He was called by people in Germany and in Italy one of the most famous artists uh, living in his age. But he was not universally liked. So afterwards, his reputation kind of went up and down. And this is something that appeals to posterity. It's somehow a compliment that we pay to ourselves to think that we understand Rembrandt so much better than his contemporaries. He was above them. He was, he was painting for us rather than for them, which is not true, but it gives an extra kind of spark and stimulus to, uh, to think of him again and again as belonging to us. And this has happened through the ages, especially in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So his popularity has been on the rise for it, the past 100 years or so? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And why do you think that is? Well, it started in the 19th century. And at that point, when artists began to think of themselves as rebels, the old characteristics that were attached to Rembrandt, that he was an asocial character, that he couldn't get along with his contemporaries, with his patrons, uh, started to turn to his advantage. So artists began identifying themselves with Rembrandt uh, and began paying tribute to Rembrandt in their own work. And this spilled over from artists to art critics, to museums, to collectors, and to the press and the public. So and it art plays and culture out. shows like us here. Exactly. <laughs> That's why we're here. But is it true? Was he actually a problematic character? I'm afraid so. In I'm sorry way? to have to way? say this. He had, I'll put it this way, if you had a disagreement with Rembrandt, the chances were much greater than with another normal human being that it was going to end up in a knockdown, drag out fight or a trip to the judge or a, a disagreement that goes to arbitration. He wasn't able to cede ground easily. So, he got into trouble with uh, patrons, with uh, contemporary uh, uh, artists, with collectors. And so uh, he had about 25 disputes that went the distance. But how do we know about these? Because he has left no like diaries, no memoirs, right? There are about 500 documents about Rembrandt in the archives of the Amsterdam notaries, in the Leiden civil archive, and in archives in France and in Italy and in Germany. So in fact, we know a lot more about Rembrandt than about most other Dutch artists of the time. What kind of documents are they? They're the kind of documents I was talking about. For example, the marriage board where he was in trouble because of his love life or because the tax authorities uh, tried to get him to pay back due taxes, <laughs> or because a, another uh, art dealer accused him of cheating him, uh, because a neighbor well, got into a fight with him about the uh, care for the joint m m wall, uh, <laughs> because his, uh, the family of his ex-wife, his, his deceased wife, was uh, suing him for support of the the child who they uh, they had. So Marvelous. those we are the kinds. We have an amazing character here. Yeah. I can tell. No, see, if there were really nice documents about Rembrandt, we would know. If people had made him, for example, the ward of a an orphan, if he had been called to witness marriages, if he had stood up for someone else's loan, we would have that kind of document. But we don't. Almost all the documents that we have concern conflicts. Mm -hmm. Now, but was he known, sorry to cut you off, but was he known during um, his lifetime in Europe, like apart from the Netherlands, as an artist? Oh, yes. Mm. Yes. There was a collector in Germany who had kept a scrapbook of oh, wow. art and uh, artists, and he put a star next to his entry for Rembrandt, and he said, he is the, the shining star of our age. So 
he was admired greatly and known for his uh, self-portraits and for his prints throughout Europe. An Italian count in Sicily invited him to make paintings for his collection. Mm -hmm. A church in Genoa ordered an uh, altarpiece from him. Self-portraits by him were in the collection of King Louis XIV of France and of the emperor in, uh, in Vienna and of the king of England. So he really was well known throughout Europe. But Gary, um, was he usually commissioned? Well, the portraits were of course all commissioned. They weren't necessarily commissioned by the sitter. Sometimes there were fans of a given person who would pay Rembrandt to paint their portrait, the portrait of the, like someone this they one admired. We're seeing behind you, well, right? the tulp was probably tulp. commissioned by the surgeon and the individuals mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, surgical uh, theater. Uh, so that was clearly a, a commission. I but can we, say that, can we say that the more central figures here in Dr. Tulp, for example, paid more money? Is that, or please enlighten me about this. Am I being a bit ignorant? But like, this is the kind of feeling that I get. The main figure would pay the most. So Tulp may have paid 200 guilders for his role and the others 100 guilders, let's say. So they might Good have investment. Been paid. <laughs> yeah, sure, you'd become famous forever. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, when we, I mean, even if you do a quick Google research about Rembrandt, what you come up with is that he was uh, part of the Dutch Golden Age. And I know you're an expert on that. So can you please talk us through uh, why that period is seen very important in terms of arts and culture? The Dutch had the largest school of painters in Europe at the time. Even though it was, small, it was a small country, it was kind of latched onto the art world in a major way so that it was a good bet for parents to train their children as artists. It was a kind of assured profession starting in the late 16th century. Rembrandt was born in 1606. Uh, and so by 1650, about one third of all of the artists in Europe were from the Northern Netherlands, which was the largest school. And not only did they work in their own country and export from the country the way Rembrandt did, but they also swarmed out all over Europe. Dutch artists gave shape to the national schools in England, in Scotland, in Poland, in the Scandinavian countries. Dutch artists worked in the major studios of Italy and France and even in Spain. So uh, they were giving shape to the European art scene at the time and everyone was looking at them. And why did Rembrandt stand out? He just had more going for him as an artist. Mm -hmm. He had universal talent. He could paint anything that was in call, uh, being called for, and especially what were called history paintings, paintings with stories, with Bible stories, with stories from mythology, stories, even sometimes allegories from contemporary history. Uh, and he was able to put those paintings together with tremendous talent for landscape, for appurtenances, and for the darkened light that gave him his great fame as an artist. Actually, I wanted to drama. ask about that. Yeah, because um, his technique uh, is very much praised upon, that dramatic use usage of light and um, shadow, right? Can you please talk us through that? I mean, in terms of his technique, why was he so mm. important? The first artist in Europe to become seriously famous just for that technique was Caravaggio hmm. in Italy. Uh, Caravaggio made a tremendous impact in uh, his own country, but also through lots of young artists working in Italy who picked up on his style and his innovations, uh, coming back then to their countries, France and the Netherlands and Germany, uh, there came into being something that was called the international Caravaggius movement. Uh, and so the idea that you could add 
interest to conventional iconographies, the kinds of themes and subjects that were in the universal use, by giving a exception, exceptional uh, effects in light and dark was something that was known. And Rembrandt made his own extremely subtle and, uh, and, and convincing use of this technique, not in a, an obvious way. He did it with all sorts of small touches. He was a painter who went through every canvas centimeter by centimeter, making small changes in, in touch, in, uh, in, the, in the coloring, in light and shadow, and used it throughout his compositions to give added interest, added effect, added drama, added meaning. Mm -hmm. He was a very subtle artist in his technique, isn't yes. he? Yes. Can you tell me, why is the Night's mm. Watch so famous? It started out famous because, you know, there were no museums in Rembrandt's time. And so if people were going to form an impression uh, of an artist who they'd heard about, there were only a few places they could go. And one of them was the new uh, meeting room of the uh, Musketeers board uh, of, uh, uh, of marksmen in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And there were big life-size group portraits of six of the main companies of musketeers. And the Night Watch was one of them. So people would go there and there were events taking place. There were weddings and receptions. But you could also just walk in off the street and compare them. And Rembrandt's Night Watch really looked different from the others. Why uh, was it? Was it like really huge in size compared it was to the, the same others. size of was it, the same size? it was okay. it wasn't even the biggest so one of the others was bigger but as one of the critics of his own time wrote the other paintings of the group of musketeers they look like playing cards that were set up one at one beside the other and with rembrandt you get one scene which is unified in its effect mm -hmm. so it, this gave something this gave people something to talk about it was something to grab onto in your discussion of Rembrandt. So they would admire this aspect of it. And then they would say, but really it's a pity that you can't see the figures in the back as well as you would like to. Yeah. Uh, and so there was an idea that uh, Rembrandt was criticized when the painting was delivered, for which there isn't any evidence, but it became a, an additional part of the myth of the Night Watch. And the idea of controversy, of being rejected and appreciated by us, is that effect I was talking about, I was about us praising ourselves for <laughs> being so much better admirers of him than his own contemporaries. As he was working really closely with um, his students, so to say, how do we know which paintings were executed by him or like done by him? Is it like how possible is it to know and um, um, what, what discussions are being um, carried on about this at the moment? Well, the famous story goes, in 1956, we're going back a ways, there was an exhibition uh, in honor of Rembrandt's 350th birthday in the Rijksmuseum. And one of the young curators at the Rijksmuseum, as he saw these paintings coming in, said, these couldn't all have been painted by the same artist. I want <laughs> to find out exactly what Rembrandt really painted. And so they put together the Rembrandt Research Project for that purpose. It started out in 1968 and was completed in 2015. So it went through half a century of work on the subject. And I don't think that they've come up with a definitive answer. I mean, what I have in my notes here is that um, 2,000 works were attributed to him, but then this Rembrandt research project uh, only could say, only could um, approve that 300 of them belonged to him. So. That's a bit of a gap, isn't it? It's bigger than that. It's there bigger were about, than that. There were okay. about 6,000 paintings that were, ever, were uh, dis explay, uh, d displayed as Rembrandt, sold as Rembrandt, published as Rembrandt in the course of the centuries. And the Rembrandt Research Project ended up with 350 that they, uh, they, th they thought would buy him. But the first thing they have to use as a criterion is what do we understand as a Rembrandt painting? 
what is our own definition of what a Rembrandt painting is, and then look for the works that answer to this definition. Exactly, like following up on that, I mm. actually am curious about what do you think is the influence of Rembrandt today on today's art scene? Rembrandt has a fabulous influence on artists. It's, I think, for a large part through his self-portraits. They are things that every artist does at one time, even if they only do them when they start out as kids. But self-portraiture is something that is so associated with Rembrandt and is such a challenge to any artist picking up a brush or a, or a pencil to, to, to look at himself. But he was quite brave about that, wasn't he? He was. He was brave about it, and he used his self-portraits in a particular way. My own theory about the self-portraits is that he used them to establish relationships with the others. He was a difficult person, I told you that, mm -hmm. and he uh, used his art in a way to establish a bridge between his own difficult personality and the people on whom he was dependent, collectors, dealers, family members. Uh, and the self-portraits was a way of associating himself uh, with other people. And this opens up a world of possibility to any artist. Uh, and so I think that's the beginning of his fascination for uh, other artists. Mm -hmm. And um, quickly before we wrap up, when is the next Rembrandt year? I was wor worrying about this in the plane coming over, and <laughs> I thought, in fact, that the first real Rembrandt year with a round number is going to be not until 2056, when we celebrate the 450th anniversary of his birth. Okay. And what we're going to do then is anybody's guess, because our understanding of Rembrandt, our definition of Rembrandt, our interest in what he meant is always in movement. Well, I hope that I'll be talking to you in 2056 about Rembrandt I will again. Fly Gary over Schwartz, immediately. art historian. Thank you so much for coming on our set today. Thank you, Evel. Rembrandt produced some of the most important paintings in history. And he also influenced and inspired artists from other disciplines. It is no surprise then that the medium of film was also touched by the Dutch master. Movies drawn from the artist's rich compositions, but also from his life, found their own admiring audience. Back in 1936, movie company London Film Productions decided to bring a retelling of painter Rembrandt van Rijn's life to the big screen as a prestige spectacle. Respected thespian Charles Lawton assumed the title role in a story which looks at the Dutch master's works after his wife's death. Peter Greenaway is one filmmaker known for his appreciation of high art. So, it didn't come as a surprise to his fans when he turned his lens to the Baroque compositions of the legendary draftsman. His night watching examines Rembrandt's life at a time when he was slumbering into poverty and expecting a child. This painting, this picture, this image. Harry Donovan is an artist. The iconic artist's works also inspired genre movies. The thriller flick Incognito in particular. It sees an aspiring painter leading a double life as a forger, laboring over a Rembrandt painting. This feature is probably the first motion picture to mix the vision of Rembrandt with the fugitive on the run tropes and other popular genres, such as romance and court drama. This order will raise a lot of eyebrows. Rembrandt has scrupulously painted an indictment of guilt. Jacques is envisioned as Peter Greenaway's companion piece to his night watching. In this documentary, the British director investigates the myth surrounding the painting The Night Watch. The conspiracy at the center of the art piece claims that it contains clues to solve a murder plot. Reviews point out that the film also sheds light on Dutch politics. Stealing Rembrandt is that unique movie which laces true crime and comedy elements together. 
Based on real events, it tells the accidental theft of the only Rembrandt original painting in Denmark by a family of crooks. The critics believe the film to be, in essence, a father-son story, albeit a darkly humorous one. That's all for this special edition of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Don't forget, you can access more of our coverage of the global arts and culture scene on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you.